I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the 13th uh, workshop domains. It was about a, a year ago that we were reminded uh, that there's a, a lot to celebrate uh, this year. Uh, the founder of our subject, Dana Scott, turned 85 last year, and it's uh, only a few months now until it's 50 years since Dana wrote that famous paper uh, on the models of the lambda calculus. Uh, but it's also a, quite an unusual uh, workshop in that the, uh, the founder of uh, this workshop series, Klaus Keimel, passed away, and we knew that he would pass away last summer, so it was kind of difficult to organize this event. Klaus does not want us, did not want us to, uh, uh, to turn this into a memorial event, and, uh, and so on, we will not. But we will have a session in the afternoon, uh, the last one today, uh, to uh, reminisce a little bit about uh, our interactions with Klaus. So that will be happening, I believe, at 7 o'clock uh, this evening. It's also a bit uh, unusual that one of our speakers uh, can't be here because he was arrested by the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard. And many of us know about that. So that's well, it's also very, uh, very sort of harrowing. But uh, we do know that he has been released on bail. And, uh, but he can't leave Iran uh, at the moment. But the talk will be uh, presented, I believe, by his Skype. Link, <coughs> not from him, but uh, from his PhD student. So, but otherwise, let's make this a very uh, joyous event, and uh, I hope we have lots of good discussions and interactions, and we look uh, uh, both backwards and forwards. And I hand over to the session chair, Mike Mislav, to introduce Daniel Scott. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Mislav. Um, I think Occam said almost everything I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a great privilege to introduce Dana at this event. Um, Dana is actually the person who uh, generated this, this workshop because he was the one who sent some emails um, about 14 months ago pointing out that Flock being in Oxford seemed an appropriate occasion to note the long history now of denotational semantics as the place where it was founded. And I want to thank the Flock organizers for uh, allowing us to put this together, and Martina Scardo and Andre Bauer, who served as the uh, chairs for the workshop. Um, Dana has a very, as always, interesting title, looking forward and looking backward, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he says. <laughs> okay. I hope you'll look backward to it also. Well, I'm very glad to be here and to see many, so many familiar faces. It's really wonderful to be back in uh, Oxford. I don't think I've been at every domain's uh, workshop. Of course, Klaus Keimel was very energetic in uh, keeping, them, keeping them going. On the list you put in the, in the uh, program, it doesn't mention China. Wasn't China a domain's workshop? I think so. That was their own series. Oh, that's the Chinese had their own uh, things. That was uh, quite fun uh, to be at. And of course, it's been, over the years, a great chance to get together uh, again. So thank you for wanting here to celebrate my birthday, having passed 85. I'm beginning to think more and more, if you live long enough, you become an historical figure. And uh, it's, of course, a little bit unsettling that uh, one has seen so many decades pass. Also unsettling to me personally to see how many opportunities I've missed in uh, doing things. And I think about that once in a while. But of course, the future must embrace this. I was a bit startled getting off the airplane in Heathrow because in the gangway coming out of the airplane there were big placards and one of them said, welcome to the UK where startups never stop. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I believe it because I know lots of startups that stopped. <laughs> But it's good to be, have a positive uh, attitude here. 
Now, uh, with this lecture today, it's something of a situation I've often thought, especially two years ago when I was in the UK, I had a lecture tour from Oxford to Birmingham to Leeds to Cambridge to London and to Paris. And I thought, well, in the olden days, famous opera singers often gave annual farewell tours. <laughs> Maybe this is a farewell tour. Well, we can only hope uh, for the future. <coughs> also, I note that this will be uh, videotaped, and I only hope I don't become a YouTube ghost. <laughs> so this is a lot of looking uh, backwards. And of course, the area that I'm thinking about is lambda calculus. And the question, of course, is how useful is it? And of course, many of you have used it for a very long time, and you know how useful it is. But I'd like to review a little bit about where it came from. One very good way of finding out where it came from is Roger Hindley and his friend uh, wrote this excellent survey. I recommend it very highly there about the history of the lambda calculus. And so if you want to know more about the history, that's a very, very good reference to, to uh, get. So just search for Hindley calculus combinators 20th century, and I'm sure you'll find it. So in a certain sense, of course, uh, Frege already used type-free functions. But the person who tried to make a kind of algebra out of the functions was Schoenfinkel. We don't know too much about him. He was at uh, Göttingen. And then, uh, as far as we know, he may have died in a, in a hospital in Moscow uh, there during, during the war. Anyway, his original paper is translated into English in the Van Hoyenort uh, volume uh, from Frege to Gödel. Now, Curry, whom I knew very well, never met Schoenfinkel. But while he was uh, working on his uh, thesis project there, his main objective was to find uh, a uh, general theory of substitution, as he called it, substituting uh, terms and other terms there. And then he said he made a, a search of the literature and came across Schoenfinkel and realized that Schoenfinkel had introduced an operator, which we now call S which was very useful, and Curry uh, then uh, took it over. But I don't think they ever met. Curry was, was a very fine person. He was, I think, the most syntactical person I know. He only believed in symbol manipulation uh, all of his uh, life. and. Uh, but I've also met other people somewhat similar to that. Ad van Weingarten, who created Algol 68, was also a symbol manipulator. Of course, Curry came from the logic side, and van Weingarten came from the computer science side. Uh, but uh, van Weingarten, again, was a, that if you can't do it by symbol manipulation, it isn't worth doing. When I... Uh, saw the Algol 68 report that they put out, I was stunned because it was a typeset on an IBM Selectric typewriter. Most of you are too young to remember golf balls that had to go on the top of typewriters. Every font required a different golf ball. It was really terrible for the secretaries to type your, your manuscripts. And there were at least a dozen different fonts in that report. So when I met Odd, I said, Odd, how did you get a secretary to type that report? 
that had a dozen golf balls necessary. He said, oh, I have a secretary who does everything I want. <laughs> he typed it himself. That's a bit like Peter Johnston. Peter Johnston typed the whole, of course, tech is easier, the whole elephant himself. So some people do it, not, not I. Anyway, uh, when Curry came back to the States after his uh, degree in uh, Germany, it, it became apparent that Alonzo Church was working on somewhat parallel lines. And uh, so then they got together, and it was realized that lambda calculus and combinatory uh, algebra were basically equivalent ways of approaching that. And uh, so uh, Church uh, started uh, as professor in uh, Princeton there uh, in the early 30s. And uh, of course, a very famous leader of the logic community. It was very lucky that in the early 30s, Gödel came to Princeton. Yes, I guess I tried to find photographs there. That's, I got that from the family. That's how church looked back in the early 30s. And that's the way I remember uh, church looking there. He had a wonderful chuckle. He could really chuckle uh, in a warm-hearted way. And Gödel, of course, always had those European glasses. And that uh, one photograph of the older Gödel is the way I remember him from uh, Princeton when I was a graduate student there in the uh, late 50s. But Gödel came to uh, Princeton uh, to lecture. And it was very, very lucky because uh, while he was lecturing there on Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Kleine and Rosser, who were the two leading uh, PhD students of uh, Church, took very, very, very careful notes uh, of Gödel's, which is extremely important for the development of their being there uh, at that time. And so uh, I couldn't find a youthful picture of Kleine, unfortunately. Uh, and that's, uh, though, how I remember him. He was very full of life, very amazing, uh, energetic character. character. Barclay Rosser was his co-student there. There is an early picture of Rosser. And then as the grand old man of mathematics, that's the way I remember him uh, also. And I'll say a bit more about their interactions uh, with the things. Now, here's a curious bit of history that I didn't realize until I started looking at dates and things like that. Of course, uh, Church published after the interactions with Gödel uh, and uh, the ideas that uh, came uh, forward there. Church realized that he could show that the uh, uh, the decision problem for predicate calculus was recursively unsolvable. Of course, they didn't have all that terminology exactly at that time, but the fact that there was an unsolvability involved there. And simultaneously, Turing was at Cambridge and was listening to lectures of Max Newman uh, on uh, logic. And he thought of the idea of uh, the Turing machines for, uh, for, uh, for implementing, so to speak, deductions in logic and was able to uh, establish. But Church beat him to it in the publication. But anyway, his uh, achievements were uh, quickly recognized. And he was invited to come as a graduate student to Princeton. But here's the very sad thing. Gödel had already left because he became ill and wanted to go back to Vienna. Rosser and Kleine finished their PhDs, and that's the mid of the Depression. They had to get jobs or fellowships right away. So they had left Princeton. Turing was only in Princeton two years, and I don't think he ever met Gödel, Rosser, and Kleine, the three people at that time who would have understood him the best there. Uh, now, here's another 
thing that, that happened, of course. Uh, Gödel didn't like Church's approach to computability using lambda calculus. Church really felt that function, some kind of function theory was a very basic idea of mathematics. And so he wanted to interpret uh, numbers as iterators. The number two means take a function and take f of f of x, iterate the function twice. That's the whole idea of two. At least Church was arguing that way. Now, if you use lambda calculus and combinators and take the Church iterators as the numerals, they're very beautiful definitions of addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. Rosser discovered exponentiation. Addition and multiplication are pretty obvious because if you just think of how you handle iterations of functions, but exponentiation, you have to iterate the iterators uh, to, defi to define exponentiation. But they had no idea then of how to define predecessor. I mean, you can't really do recursion if you can't go to ca calculate it n in terms of n minus 1. You need predecessor to do that. So as Claney writes in his uh, historical reminiscence, he went to the dentist. And while he was sitting in the dentist chair, he saw how to do predecessor. And here is the key thing that Claney discovered, which he then implemented fully in his uh, thesis, and which Church, and uh, with the help of Rosser, they really didn't get to. And it's the reason that they could never convince Gödel that it was the right way to go. What Claney did was to show, in terms of lambda calculus, that you can get all kinds of data structures, <coughs> pairs, triples, sequences, combinations of things, and you can iterate through those things to search for something. And so if only they had been able to say, look, we can uh, simulate all kinds of manipulation of data in the lambda calculus, that would have, should have been convincing to Gödel that lambda calculus was powerful. So Claney realized that, and that's what he did with his thesis. And then after he finished his thesis, he wrote another paper. You see, at the time that Gödel was there, he emphasized the idea of a higher recursion. It was already known that primitive recursion was only the beginning of recursion, and that there are many more complicated recursions. And so with correspondence with Ebrard, they uh, put forward a, a notion of uh, ebron girdle recursiveness using equational computations with more complicated recursion uh, relationships there. So what Claney did, once he understood, first of all, he fully understood Girdle's method of arithmetization of representing all kinds of things for syntactical manipulation in terms of Gödel numbers. So Claney uh, understood that uh, completely. But then once he saw that what you could do in the lambda calculus, he was then able to simulate in the lambda calculus all the deductions that are necessary for doing ebron girdle recursions. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a substitution and uh, equational reasoning, uh, starting with certain hypotheses about relationships, the recursion equations they're using there. So once that Claney realized that lambda calculus was strong enough to do girdle numbering, he could simulate in lambda calculus ebron girdle recursions. Likewise, ebron girdle recursions, again using girdle numbers, can simulate lambda calculus. So Claney proved lambda definability and ebron girdle recursiveness were equivalent. And it was published. And he left Princeton for his first job. Turing arrives. And Turing immediately says, oh, I can do those simulations on Turing machines. So he proved that lambda definability and Turing computability are equivalent. But I think. Claney should get the principle 
the principal credit there because he put to work Gödel's ideas uh, once he was able to really control uh, lambda calculus. And people gloss over the history much too quickly. Of course, uh, <coughs> Turing was a genius and had so many ideas. We were at a, for his uh, centenary, I was at, on a panel, and someone said, what would Turing be working on if he had lived? And I immediately said, he wouldn't have been working in recursive function theory. Because recursive function theory has become vastly technical. Page after page after page of awful formulas. And that wasn't Turing's style at all. He solved problems from first principles. He didn't go into that kind of enormous development that we've seen in uh, recursive function theory. That's nothing against research. It's just it wasn't, I believe, Turing's style of thinking. My extremely good friend, Robin Gandhi, was Turing's one and only PhD student. And of course, he was my colleague here uh, in uh, the 70s here in uh, Oxford. And of course, had great influence on students and generally on uh, recursive function theory. I met Christopher Strachey in the summer of 1969 at an IFIP working group. A number of uh, well-known people were there. And I found Strachey extremely engaging with his ideas about design of computer languages because, of course, logic and recursion theory are one thing on the theoretical side. But if you really want to do it, you have to have a convenient language for putting that all in some sort of computable, uh, readable form. But there were lots of competing uh, suggestions on, on how to uh, do it. Unfortunately, uh, Strachey's project at Cambridge under Morris Wilkes was to uh, create the Cambridge programming language for the machine that Wilkes was just finishing at the time. If only they had implemented Algol 58, they would have been super world famous. But the design of the Cambridge programming language never got finished. Wilkes never forgave Strachey for not completing that uh, project. I heard him speak very bitterly about the memory of Strachey <coughs> on uh, that account. Uh, so it's a quirk of history there about, I mean, of course, things were very competitive with different uh, places working on uh, creating uh, stored program computers. But it's too bad that Cambridge just missed out on that uh, because of language design. But in any case, Strachey had uh, all kinds of ideas and had started the programming research group uh, here in Oxford. And so after uh, getting to uh, know him at that IFIP conference meeting, uh, I felt that I really wanted to go further to understand uh, the, the uh, ideas he was putting forth there. One thing that he was using was lambda calculus. And at that time, I said, look, lambda calculus has no models. We really have to go back and look at recursive function theory to think of the kind of structures for a higher type recursions. And so that's what I was trying to convince him of when I came to Oxford in, for the Michaelmas term of 69. Another person who was very influential in uh, understanding lambda calculus was Corrado Berm. And uh, luckily for a fish shrift uh, for uh, Corrado, both Gordon Plotkin and I were able to publish our old reports, unpublished papers. Uh, and uh, of course, many times we met uh, Corrado. He was very, uh, very uh, entertaining and very influential as a leader in uh, Italy. Terribly sad, he was uh, very much uh, involved in 69 
and he had a position over at uh, Warwick, uh, David Park, and he had had an interesting uh, career because he started at MIT uh, with McCarthy, McCarthy at the beginning of LISP there and contributed very much to that, and then he returned to the UK, and it was terribly sad uh, that he passed away uh, so early. John Reynolds was also here in 69 and uh, immediately uh, took up ideas there and, of course, has been very, very influential and had many students and many, many different uh, contributions of his own to uh, programming language understanding there. Uh, Robin Milner, I actually only met first in 79 when he was in uh, Stanford. And then I visited him in Edinburgh and I visited him in Cambridge over the years. I had put forward some ideas about higher type recursions to have some kind of logical calculus for uh, recursive functions of higher type. Uh, and so that became, uh, he wanted to uh, make that more uh, formal and actually implement things on the computer. LCF, he took up uh, from uh, that. And then, of course, in order to implement that on the computer, you had to have a programming language to do it. And so they had to have some kind of meta language in order to do the deductions in LCF. And that's what ML came from. And then, of course, ML had a, has still a long life of its own as a functional programming language that's been, I think, very important for the development. And so all of that was sparked by the developments of Robin Milner. Another person uh, involved in a different way with things like uh, lambda calculus was Dick de Brown. And of course, he invented uh, automath with his uh, students in uh, Holland. And he also invented the de Brown indices for doing substitution of uh, bound variables. I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, and he was a really interesting person, a major mathematician. He did so many things in mathematics. He also did an analysis of Penrose tiles. You can see the Penrose tiles out on the plaza up there. And uh, so uh, it's very interesting of how you use higher dimensional uh, spaces and projections to understand non-periodic tiles. Uh, de Brown had an amazing mathematical uh, facility. A longtime friend, McCarthy was a little bit preceding me at Princeton. He didn't do a degree in logic. He did a degree in differential equations under uh, Lefschetz. But then after he went to MIT, he uh, turned to the question of uh, computers and uh, then developed, uh, as you know, a long history there, but developed LISP there. The beginning of AI was McCarthy and uh, Blocky on his name uh, there. And then, of course, uh, LISP was the language in order to uh, implement ideas from artificial intelligence. And then, uh, in later years, McCarthy was at Stanford for a long time, where I knew him very, very well, also in uh, California. And today, we're going to remember Klaus Keimel. I didn't put anything about his career here on this slide, because people will say things uh, this afternoon here, but I did like that smiling picture of him. And I was intrigued by the ancestral sequence there. I think Carl Hoffman must have done the research to put that together. Carl Hoffman was, uh, was the thesis advisor for Klaus uh, Keimel. And I was a little startled that Felix Klein is earlier in that sequence than Hilbert. I always thought of Hilbert and Klein as, as contemporary. But here's what happened. Klein was very, very brilliant and was very early on made professor. And so then his first student was Lindemann, 
who eventually uh, was the person who proved the transcendence of pi, which was a very important uh, result. And then he got a professorship in Königsberg, and that's where he was the thesis advisor of Hilbert, and then that went on through Kinesier and Hofmann on to Carmel. People tend to forget history, so I like to put those things together to uh, remember also uh, when they lived, when people uh, did things. Now I want to go, how is our time? Not too bad. I want to go to think about uh, the calculus. So the question is, can you have a sensible type-free theory of functions and the well-known axioms for uh, lambda calculus are uh, put up there, alpha, beta, eta. I realized in writing up the slides also for doing some lectures uh, recently that it's a terrible pain in the neck, neck to keep track of free and bound variables. And of course, Curry avoided it altogether by having combinators which involve no bound variables. But if you look at Curry's book, the formulas are about that long and unreadable as far as I'm concerned. Lambda calculus can become unreadable too, but I think somehow it condenses things sometimes better uh, if you're careful of uh, how you uh, notate things. And of course, that was one of the things that De Bruyne needed for automath was to handle free and bound variables, and he invented the uh, the Brown indices. And then, of course, we have nominal logic, too, that's very uh, popular. Uh, and so uh, you really need it for using the computers, I'm afraid. I can't do it myself. And I say, I know the problems of free and bound variables. I won't make any mistakes. I hope not. And I realize in writing this up that I don't even think that what I stated here is entirely uh, rigorous. But the first axiom, these uh, notations are from Curry, is alphabetic variance. A bound variable can always be rewritten as another bound variable as long as you don't confuse free and bound variables in doing that uh, rewriting. And then the sex second axiom Curry called beta. Why did Curry call the second axiom beta? Because it's the second letter of the Greek alphabet. Sorry about that. Why did Church use lambda for his operator? So I often wondered about that. Hank Barndrack has published a completely apocryphal uh, story about it coming from the circumflex operator that uh, Bertrand Russell used. But one, one day in Berkeley, I went up to John Addison, who is uh, Church's uh, son-in-law. I said, John, why did Church use lambda, do you know? He said, no, I don't know. I said, why don't you write him and ask him? So he just wrote a postcard. Dear Professor Church, it said. He always referred to his father-in-law as Professor Church. Dear Professor Church, Russell had the iota operator. Hilbert had the epsilon operator. Why did you choose lambda for your operator? Now, Church didn't write back a very long letter. He just annotated the postcard, popped it in an envelope, and sent it back. And the full annotation is as follows. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> it was just another Greek letter that was convenient to choose. It's really unfortunate choice, too, because in, uh, in, in uh, linear algebra, lambda is always used as a multiplier. And people who don't know about logic or are very confused by using lambda, I think you know, it's possible that if we'd use another notation, it, lambda calculus might have become more popular. And then uh, they uh, like to use the eta uh, rule there, which they called extensionality. It does imply a kind of extensionality, but it really isn't a good uh, axiom in my view. What it says, everything is a function. But 
maybe not everything is a function, or at least is not the kind of function that you want to use with the lambda there. So I have reasons for using and not using that axiom there. Anyway, those are the axioms for lambda calculus. So now in making some models here, I wanted to look a little bit backwards, but look a little bit forward about uh, thinking about the theories, <coughs> theories of models there. And I'm going to discuss it here for a little bit uh, without uh, reference to, uh, to uh, logic or uh, uh, computing. First, models will, will find, will come from the notion of algebraic lattices. Why are algebraic lattices called algebraic lattices? Does anybody know? Uh, they modeled all the group, subgroups of, or subgroups. That's right. Of, Came from universal algebra. So ideals of a ring is a good one. Subgroups of a group, right? Another good example are logical theories. Those, uh, if, if you have a axioms and rules of inference there, then a theory is a set of formulas closed under deduction. So the family of theories forms an algebraic lattice. And with ideals or subgroups or theories, you can see that the lattice structure there because those families are closed under arbitrary intersection. And whenever you have a family of sets closed under arbitrary intersection, you're going to have a complete lattice. Intersection will be intersection. Union in the lattice will be the intersection of everything, including the, the things there. It's usually larger than the set theoretical union. But it uh, came from universal algebra and those. Now, when I introduced the original d infinity model, I did it in terms of lattices because I came originally, my first very small independent research was in universal algebra when I was a sophomore uh, at uh, Berkeley. And so I thought in terms of uh, things like uh, lattices. And so those complete lattices have top elements in it. And I wanted to reinterpret uh, the lattice uh, ideas there in terms of an information ordering. If you think in terms of sets, you can say one set is included in another set. The larger set has more information. So there's a kind of information ordering there. And you can make up other abstract structures that have that feeling of an information ordering there. And now the bottom element means no information. That's clear enough. But what in the heck does the top element mean? It worked out algebraically and model theoretically very nicely, but it really annoyed people trying to apply the idea of information structures in some ways, having a top element. So a way to get around that, to get rid of the tops, is to just use the topologically closed subsets of the algebraic lattices as quite a rich uh, collection of things. I'll explain that a little bit more. Of course, another kind of uh, way of approaching models for lambda calculus is in terms of partial combinatory algebras. And those are usually defined just axiomatically uh, there. But in a, instead of taking application of a function to an argument as being totally defined, you take it as a partial function. I'm not going to discuss it further, but of course, it's a very important uh, use that people are using all the time. Now, what I was saying that in the first two cases of the things from lattices, there's a very natural topology that comes along with those structures. I'll say a little bit more about it. Now, in the partial combinatory algebras, Kleene uh, thought of uh, two of them, one for arithmetic and one for analysis. And his second model is really just uh, the topological space n to the n, the topological space of all infinite sequences of natural numbers, which is also called the bare space. 
And so, of course, it has a good topology there, and the topology is important for understanding the properties of that uh, particular model. Now, what I'm going to emphasize here is that in the algebraic lattice kind of approach, there are universal uh, models there. And I think we could do more in understanding the scope of universal models there. I don't know what to say about Claney's K2 and what kind of category to think of that in having a universal model. There must be some good answers there, but I haven't uh, thought about it. The thing that happens with uh, these structures, and this is the key thing to getting to lambda calculus, is that the function spaces of continuous functions under the topology that you get there, the function spaces are also nice structures. It's a very annoying thing that in point set topology, we usually start with Hausdorff spaces. The function spaces in topology don't necessarily have an easy-to-handle topology. And so there really are difficulties in thinking about higher type function spaces and topological spaces. But if you work from the algebraic lattice uh, point of view, the higher type function spaces fall right in uh, very easily. And that's, that was the key to the uh, success. In particular, let's look at the universal thing for algebraic lattices there. The power set of the integers becomes a T0 topological space where each finite set determines a neighborhood. A finite set you can think of as a finite amount of information about a possible set. And so all the sets that share that finite amount of information give uh, a neighborhood and that gives you the topology there. And so it's easy to see that the open subsets of this topology are very easily characterized. The continuous functions are very easily characterized because you can think in terms of finite approximations. A continuous function is such that a finite amount of information about a function value is already determined by a finite amount of information about the argument that you're putting in there. And so that's the key to the behavior of the uh, function spaces. And we'll see why we have universal spaces here in a moment. So one notion of un universality for T0 spaces, you see in analysis, how store spaces come from the real numbers and uh, other uh, spaces in analysis. Uh, those have a very uh, strong separation property that any two distinct points have disjoint neighborhoods. That's the Hausdorff uh, axiom. T0 is weaker. It says each point is uniquely determined by its own neighborhoods. Two distinct points have different sets of neighborhoods. It may turn out that one point has more neighborhoods than the first given point there. But if they're distinct points, the set of neighborhoods of the two points are different. That's the T0 uh, axiom. And so it was already known by Alexandrov when I was just a baby there that uh, the power set of the integers, and you can generalize it to higher cardinalities as well, is universal for T0 spaces because in our case we have a space X with countably many neighborhoods. So for each point of X, you just keep track of the subscripts N there of the neighborhoods that contain X. So that gives a mapping from points of the abstract topological space into sets of integers. And amazingly, it's a very easy proof. That turns out to be a uh, continuous embedding of the abstract space into power set of n. In other words, power set of n has an easy topology, and its subspaces encompass examples of all possible countably based T0 
spaces. So that's a kind of universality. One space is universal for many other spaces there. And then the space of continuous functions there, the easiest way, and this was the way I originally uh, thought of it. Oh, no, this is another universality thing. I got ahead of my parts here. Another very good property of the uh, power set space is that it has plenty of elements there so that you can freely extend functions. If you have any continuous function on the subspace of another space, continuous function into power set of n, then you can always consistently extend that function definition to being a continuous function on the larger space, no matter how large the space is. Even though power set of n is a fixed size, you can keep extending, extending, extending to any superspace of any size there. There are enough elements of P of n to allow for those extensions. So a very fine uh, review of those kind of properties and proofs is in uh, Martin Escardo's paper that I uh, mentioned there. And so if you're interested in that kind of topological fact, uh, Martin's paper is very helpful uh, for that. Now, if I take an algebraic lattice, I can also embed it as a sublattice pretty much into the power set of n. Because if you go back to universal algebra, if you take subgroups of a group, a subgroup may have finitely many generators, which are sufficient when you combine it under the group operations to get all the elements. Or the subgroup may require infinitely many generators. Well, let's think of the finitely generated ones, and I call them finite for short. In the lattice of subgroups of a group, the finitely generated subgroups I'm just calling as finite elements for short here. And the property of finite elements that you can do in an abstract setting is that a finite element, when contained in a directed union of larger and larger elements there, if it's contained in the directed union, it's already contained at an initial step some initial step. In other words, you can reduce a possible infinite union to a finite union containing your finite element there. That's very reminiscent of the definition of compact elements in topological spaces, and so many people call finite elements compact. Hey, Wikipedia, I looked up a lot of stuff in Wikipedia. Uh, Freeman J. Dyson was heard to say once, all of my colleagues complain about Wikipedia, and all of them use it. <laughs> there are a lot of excellent articles in Wikipedia, but the articles on compact element and algebraic lattice are barely stubs. Somebody has to improve Wikipedia for those two entries. Just start with compact elements there. Uh, what it says is OK as far as it goes. But the thing about algebraic lattices is, is uh, sort of hopeless. Someone should, should uh, uh, revise those. Now, of course, this suggests that algebraic lattices just have a topology where the finite elements determine the neighborhoods of the space. So this really is just the same as the, uh, as the uh, topological embedding. But it has the algebraic property here, this kind of embedding of one algebraic lattice in the, our universal one power set of n, that it preserves arbitrary intersections and directed unions. It doesn't preserve joins. Joins tend to join together to give you more stuff. As you're generating more and more stuff, it interacts with each other, and you get larger things than just unions. But it still has very nice uh, lattice uh, properties. I may just be able to make it a, oops, okay. Now the space of continuous functions from one algebraic lattice to another 
And this was really the first thing that I discovered was that if you think in terms of the finite elements and having only countably many finite elements, it's then an a, a argument to check that the continuous functions can be related by uh, thinking of building up things with a finite amount of input-output information at a time. And so you work out, that was really the first thing that I did, and I was trying to tell Strachey, let's start with, uh, say, partial functions on the integers, and then let's think of functionals as being continuous functions on those, and then higher type functions will be continuous functions on the tops of those, and everything works out nicely to be an algebraic lattice with uh, uh, algebraic lattice with uh, uh, only countably many uh, finite elements, and that was the the key to the thing. Because if you think of the embedding property, if you have a, a algebraic lattice, you can embed it into the universal one. And then the universal one can be retracted onto the subalgebra there because you just say, if you take any element here, let's just go down to the largest element that you need in the sublattice there. Any embedded sublattice with arbitrary unions, arbitrary intersections and directed unions you'll be able to retract onto it. Therefore, because of the embedding property, the function space of the universal space is a subspace of the universal space. So that means, as far as the universal space goes, you don't need to make any difference between elements and continuous functions. You see, I could have discovered it that way if I put two and two together at the time, but it was a very uh, slow uh, progress there. I'm going to have to skip a couple of slides here, I see here. So I can, I can do this uh, finding the uh, retraction to the function space very directly by simple uh, uh, things there in the lambda calculus models. But another thing I want to say of historical nature here is the kind of structures that are needed if you start with a power set of n really were already quite clear in the recursive function theory when I was a graduate student at Princeton uh, under church and Claney came on sabbatical one year. I knew everybody uh, at that time. I knew John Myhill. Later on, of course, I met John Shepherson very well known in logic. So Myhill and Shepherdson, when Myhill was in, uh, in the UK, wrote a paper about uh, effective operations on partial recursive functions. And in that paper they say, oh, look at all the neat uh, operations we can define. In other words, they really invented lambda abstraction in doing it. Quite independently, uh, Hartley Rogers and, uh, and uh, Richard Friedberg, who was an undergraduate, brilliant undergraduate at uh, MIT, introduced the idea of enumeration operators. They wanted to study uh, reducibility. Turing reducibility requires both positive and negative information in making a reduction of one decision problem to another. But Rogers and Friedberg thought, well, maybe if you only use partial information, you have a simpler theory of reducibility. And then Turing reducibility is a fragment of enumeration reducibility. So Rogers and Friedberg, and it's in Hartley Rogers' book, they define what it means for one set B to be reducible to another set A. It means B is equal to an enumeration operator applied to A. That means B has been reduced to A. 
That enumeration operator is just a continuous function. They took only the recursively enumerable or computable continuous functions there. But the definition of what the operator applied to a set does can be done for any subset of integers. So in other words, Rogers and Friedberg defined application. Myhill and Shepherdson did lambda abstraction, but nobody, as far as I know, and I wish I could have asked them about it. Why didn't I ask them about it? Nobody put two and two together to say, well, therefore, you have a model for the lambda calculus. I'm going to skip over a couple of other things here, too. It's very easy for the universal space to make it equal to its own square. So therefore, uh, subsets of the universal space can be thought of as <coughs> binary relations, and then a very important idea that people have used over and over again. I learned it originally from uh, Kreisel and Trostra. Uh, you get other interesting things out of the subsets by taking quotients of subsets of your space. And uh, so the theory of types can be developed on top of that. And I haven't really left any time here to describe how it might go. So I have to skip over here a little bit to uh, get to the conclusion. Starting with that universal model for the lambda calculus and introducing the types that way gets you to the theory of dependent types and the way that uh, Dick de Brown wanted to do in Automath and that Per Martin Lerf did in his theory of types. When I first heard Per Martin Lerf lecture about uh, types, he used type-free lambda terms, but then dozens of rules for typing terms. And I thought, you see, Church emphasized using typed lambda calculus. Shouldn't Martin Lerf have been using types on his lambda terms in connection with those rules of how things can be typed? Well, it turns out that it isn't necessary. I mean, he did everything axiomatically and formalistically, and I didn't really understand at the time, back in the 70s when I first uh, heard him there. But if you start with this universal model for lambda calculus and uh, do the partial equivalence relations, the quotients of subsets as types there, you get all the rules that Martin Lerf liked to have for, uh, for there. So now, I think uh, three things should be done for the future. First of all, we should develop more the power set model there. I think there's much more to do. And the thing that I would especially like to do in the future is after you have a type theory, you have the function theory and the type theory. Then you ought to have a functor theory on top of that. In other words, you ought to be able to, to do a lot with uh, proving properties of type operations. And I see a lot of special examples of that, but I think there should be a better theory. And one thing that seems very interesting here is in this universal models. They have intrinsic topology and intrinsic ideas of computability in them. In the power set of n, for example, the computable elements are the recursively enumerable ones. And they have many good properties of uh, ideas of computability. But you can do much more with that. But then there is the no-top model there that I think needs more development there. The no-top model is easily explain not the power set of the set of integers. It's the set of consistent theories in propositional calculus. Instead of the integers, which are countable, 
to use the formulas of propositional calculus, in other words, the free Boolean algebra. So consider all the uh, proper filters of the free Boolean algebra. That's a very nice space. And that's a universal space for the things without tops there. But I think more investigation has to be made of how to go from that and continue on to higher types. And so that's advice. As far as Claney's uh, K2 with a partial, uh, partial combinatorial algebra, I think that needs to be put into a, into a wider context at all. Now here's what I especially want to see in the future, and I hope I can see to leave it to, to do this, is that these things really need computer-based theorem proving. I mean, I complained about recursive function theory as being too complicated. How do we know the proofs in recursive function theory really are correct if they require seven, eight pages to write out there? Well, even with these models, which in the beginning can be done in a very elementary way, the proofs still get fairly intricate. And so we really need to do computer-based proofs. Today, it's possible. There are many uh, systems, Koch, Agda, uh, and uh, Isabel, and uh, the, the, one, the other one, uh, Jeremy Avogad, is very keen in uh, promoting uh, another system too. All of those systems can do higher order logic and if you look at this model building, you especially don't have to go very high to get complicated facts there. Sets of integers, sets of sets of integers, sets of sets of sets of integers will get you a very, very long way. And we can implement all of those proofs in these theorem proving systems in order to uh, not only to uh, check uh, correctness of things, but also to discover new proofs, and I feel that that's going to be essential for the future to, uh, in developing these theories. I'm sorry that I rushed at the end. Thank you very much for your attention today, and thanks to the organizers for making this whole session possible. Thank you.